This is the Louis T. Network. In the lab room. Exclusive. Welcome to this In the Lab Room exclusive. I'm your host, Lou. Thank you for joining me. Black Monday. The most gruesome day in the National Football League. And I'm dressed in all black like the omen because it's a day where head coaches are on the chopping block. You work hard all season long to put your team in a position to win. It doesn't go the way that everyone hoped it would turn out. And at the end of the day, GMs, head coaches, CEOs, owners, they all come together, they get in one room, and they come to some sort of conclusion, whether it be a coach is allowed to come back, in the case of Rex Ryan and the New York Jets, or they agree to part ways mutually, in the case of Mike Shanahan, or a coach is unceremoniously fired in the case of the Cleveland Browns and Rob Chazinski. So there are so many different ways these things can go. And I'm not a big advocate for coaches getting fired. I, I hate to see people lose their job. But at some point, it's time for that to take place. In some instances, it's time for a change. Uh, one guy needs to exit stage left. The next guy needs to come in and try to right the ship. And, and in certain instances, like Detroit, I think change is necessary. In some instances, you feel like maybe that guy got a raw deal, like in Minnesota with Leslie Frazier. But all in all, at the end of the day, the results are still the same for all of these locations. All of these head coaches have been fired. And there are openings in all of these locations. And in one, there's a GM and a head coaching vacancy. So let's break down Black Monday. I'll give you my take on all of these head coaching vacancies. I'll talk about how they came to be, why I think they came to be, and how these teams got to this point and what is the future in these organizations. So let's get to the big board. And I, I got a timeline here as to how this all unfolded as we look at the Black Monday uh, situation in the NFL this year. There are currently six head coaching vacancies. I'll go down the list one by one in sequential order. There is a time frame here when all of these have taken place. And so I will go in numerical order in the way that they happen and you start with December 6th the Houston Texans decide to fire Gary Kubiak I saw this one coming a mile away as you probably did as well Gary Kubiak had the stroke and he was already on the hot seat when he had the stroke on the Sunday night football game against the Indianapolis Colts however when he came back he made some comments he did some things that I thought rubbed the front office the wrong way and he still had loyalty to Matt Schaub and that I couldn't understand because Matt Schaub hasn't won you anything in this league. It'd be one thing if Matt Schaub won you a championship and you felt obligated to give this man an opportunity to prove that he can still play at a high level in this league but that wasn't the case. Matt Schaub has only won you one playoff game and he hasn't done much. I didn't see the need to go and risk your job for Matt Schaub. This team underachieved grossly in 2013 after winning the division and, and really making a little bit of noise in the postseason last year to come out and play the way they did this season. Really no excuse for it. And then you look at the situation with Case Keenum in the front office wanting to find out if Case Keenum is in fact the guy at the quarterback position. At the time, he looked like he could be something special at the quarterback position. And here comes Gary Kubiak coming back after the stroke, stirring the pot, talking about how he's made no decisions on the quarterback position and how he's not done with Matt Schaub yet. And 
really undermining what this front office staff wanted to do at the quarterback position. They knew that Matt Schaub wasn't the answer and isn't the future in Houston. Everyone knew that. Seems like except for Gary Kubiak. And I don't know if that was a measure to try to save his job, try to win some games, stick the veteran back out there. But it, it was about finding out what the future held in Houston. And the future was going to be either Case Keenum or someone else who's not on the roster currently that's probably still in the college ranks. Not Matt Schaub and Gary Kubiak. I thought he got that confused. And so he basically made his own bed when he came back and said, I'm going back to Matt Schaub. And when he did that, I thought that was the last straw in Houston for him. And uh, he bit the dust on December 6th, got his pink slip, and took a walk. So he'll find work. He's a good offensive mind in this league. He'll find work, just not as a head coach in Houston and, and nowhere else in the National Football League will he get a head coaching job currently. Maybe if he helps down the line orchestrate someone's offense and they explode and score a lot of points, maybe he'll become a hot commodity again. But right now, Gary Kubiak's name won't be in anybody's circles in terms of a head coaching gig. He'll definitely be an offensive coordinator again in this league, however. You look at December 29th, we move on to Sunday night, end of the season, last game of the season for the Cleveland Browns. They wrap up their season with a loss and a very lackluster effort against the Pittsburgh Steelers on the road in Pittsburgh. And this one was one that I didn't see coming. We heard reports about it Sunday evening, right before the Sunday night football game, that Rob Chazinski could be fired as early as tonight, being Sunday night. And it just didn't register with me because, again, didn't see this one coming. That's number one. Number two, this guy just got this job last season. Number three, he inherited some circumstances that were unfortunate. And who knows what this season would have been if Billy Ho, that being Brian Hoyer, stays healthy. They were playing some good football. They were 3-2. and two. They were atop that division. He gets injured. You got to go back to Brandon Whedon and then Jason Campbell. And, and you, you know how that dynamic goes. You don't have a quarterback. You don't have a chance in this league. And he, he really did a lot, I thought, with the limited resources he had at the quarterback position. And that's what it all boils down to. They've got receivers. They've got tight ends. They've got no running game. Right now, I mean, they, they had a guy off the street in Edwin Baker running the football out of Michigan State, undrafted rookie free agent, and Willis McGahee, old man Willis. So no running game rich to really speak of, yet you get Josh Gordon out there, leads the league in receiving yards with 1,600, uh, over 1,600, and you've got all these quarterbacks throwing him the football, and I thought that was a product of Rob Chazinski getting it done as an offensive mind, being a head coach. They still were able to do some things offensively, even though this team didn't have a quarterback. And defensively, I think they got one of the better defenses in this league. They got a lot of talent on this team. They just don't have a quarterback. And I thought if they gave Rob Chazinski a quarterback, which they would be able to do in this year's draft, they could do some things in Cleveland. And I just thought they went in the totally opposite direction. But here's why. And I said this, and I kind of alluded to this during the Cleveland Browns-Pittsburgh Steelers breakdown. Here's why Rob Chazinski was fired. The Browns did this backwards, okay? So in order to go and clean up a mess that they made last season, they got rid of Rob Chazinski. I think he was collateral damage here. Look, they went out and hired him first and then went back and hired their GM. Their GM is Lombardi, Michael Lombardi. And this is how it goes in this league. The GM wants to be in the room when the head coach is hot. They want to handpick the head coach. Say, I said this before and I'll say it again. Just like with head coaches and quarterbacks, if you're a head coach and you come into a system and you come into a team and they already have a quarterback but they're not sure about that quarterback, you, you want to take a look at this quarterback for yourself and say, hey, okay, no, I don't want this guy. Let me get my own guy in here and figure out if that's the, the guy that's going to lead my team into the future. You don't want to have a guy that you inherit that's not any good, that got the last coach fired. Well, he got the last coach fired. What's going to be any different with me? Let me get my own quarterback in here so if I get fired, at least I can say, hey, I went down with my gun loaded full of my own bullets and I just didn't get it done. I went down guns a blazing. 
Now, you, you come, you show up, they give you a quarterback, and, and that quarterback doesn't work out. You got an empty gun, you're shooting blanks, you get fired, you feel like, I, I didn't get a chance, I got a raw deal. And same thing with a GM. A GM comes in, and he wants to put his imprint on a football team. He wants to put his thumbprint on the team, put his stamp, and the way to do that is to get your head coach in there. And you get your head coach, and the head coach gets his quarterback, and everything screams, me, this is me. And if it doesn't work, then you fall on your sword. You say, hey, I went out, I handpicked this coach, he didn't work out, the quarterback didn't work out, it's all on me. So if you get fired, you say, hey, I did that. I did that, that was me. Much like Mike Tannenbaum in New York with the Jets. He went out, he handpicked the head coach, Rex Ryan, he handpicked Mark Sanchez. They went out, Sanchez hasn't worked out, Rex Ryan did and didn't work out, all at the same time, he made some bad moves. It was all on him. He got fired. That's what GMs want to do. They want to come in and they want to make their stamp on a franchise. Well, the Browns did it backwards. The GM wasn't in the room when Chudzinski was hired. The GM didn't have any say-so in that process. He showed up and they threw a head coach on him and said, here, that's your head coach. Make it work. Well, Mike Lombardi said, okay, I'll take him. I'll make it work. And then... They get off to a 3-2 and two start. He said, this isn't that bad. I can work with this. And then you look at the Browns. They have some injuries at the quarterback position. Things go south, and they lose seven in a row to finish up the season at 4-12. and 12. And all of a sudden, he's saying, hey, this isn't my guy. We're 4-12. and 12. I don't want to be blamed for his misgivings. I don't have anything to do with this. Let me get my guy in here, and let's go from there. And so the Browns said, okay, I'll, I'll grant you that this isn't your guy and I don't want him to be a reflection of you. Okay, let's get rid of him. Now, the Browns will try to sell you on the fact that they don't like the way the team was playing down the stretch and they lost seven games in a row. That's hogwash. If you sit there and you're buying that, then you'll buy anything. And you can't listen to what they're saying because they're saying anything to, to provide damage control at this point. Whatever sounds like the right thing to say, that's what they're going to say right now. But the fact of the matter is, this is a move to get Mike Lombardi a chance to, to handpick a head coach. And that's what this move screams to me. An opportunity for Mike Lombardi as the GM to come in and get his guy in as the head coach. And, and Rob Chazinski wasn't his guy. And, and to me, that's the bottom line in that situation. So Chazinski gets canned Sunday night. He's the first casualty, the first real casualty of Black Monday. You move on to actual Monday, the day after, where all the carnage usually ensues. And bright and early Monday morning, 8 a.m., Minnesota Vikings decide to fire Leslie Frazier. Now, this one... I can't say that I totally agree with and I totally disagree with either. Now, here's the, the situation in Minnesota. Leslie Frazier was in the room and was the biggest supporter of Christian Ponder. That was a move that was highly scrutinized by many, including myself. I didn't think that he was a first round draft pick. They went out, they spent a high pick on him and this is the problem in Minnesota. You've got a workhorse back in Adrian Peterson. Adrian Peterson. He's not getting any younger. In running back years, he's starting to get up there. The more you hand him the rock, the older he becomes. You've got a back that can take you to the Super Bowl. But you've got a quarterback position that's holding you back. So, you go out and you get Christian Ponder and he's not the answer. Yet... You, you handpicked him, so you're married to that quarterback. If he doesn't work, you don't work. He has to go, and so do you. And I think the Vikings are at the point now where they're at a crossroads because we went out, we spent money on Greg Jennings. We went out, we had a heck of a draft, got Cordell Patterson. We got the young guy Rhodes out of Florida State. And we went and got Sharif Floyd out of Florida. So we had a heck of a draft first round. Got you some stuff to play with. 
You went 10 and 6 last year, made it to the postseason. We're looking for big things this year. We give you Greg Jennings. We give you some targets to throw to. We got some things around. We did some things in the draft. We feel confident that we're supposed to be better than we were a season ago. Problem is, you didn't upgrade the quarterback position. It's the same as it was last year. And honestly, it wasn't very good last year. You had an anomaly. Adrian Peterson, in a quest for 2,000 yards, he rushes for 2,000 yards, and in the process of doing so, wins you football games. Quarterback position didn't win you football games. Well, you had to know Adrian Peterson wasn't going to repeat those kind of numbers, and you weren't going to win those type of games this season. Teams were going to load that box up and force the quarterback position to beat them. Well, you weren't able to do that this year. You took a monumental step backwards, and it's easy to blame the head coach, Leslie Frazier, in that particular situation. He's a defensive-minded head coach. The defense was good. The offense wasn't, and he got fired because he believed in Christian Ponder. He was in the room pounding the table for Christian Ponder, and he didn't get it done. And I think that ultimately got him fired. Now, you look at the success of last year and the lackluster year they had this year, that also had something to do with it. But at the end of the day, Christian Ponder didn't work out. And because he didn't work out, Leslie Frazier didn't work out. And it's a shame because... There was no reason for Leslie Frazier to get fired. I felt like he did a lot of good in Minnesota. And if he was given a quarterback, I think he could have done some things. But again, he handpicked that quarterback. So you make your bed, you got to lay in it. So unfortunately, down goes Frazier. Down goes Frazier. At 8 a.m., Leslie Frazier out in Minnesota. You move on to 937 on Black Monday. And the Washington Redskins finally and the tumultuous situation in D.C. with Mike Shanahan by firing him and his entire staff, or at least the majority of it. I think there are some erroneous reports out there that say the whole entire staff is gone. I think some of the guys have been retained. At least six or seven of the coaches that they feel are still good coaches have been retained on that staff. So uh, all of his guys, the Shanahan, quote unquote, the Shanahan guys, they're all gone. Eight of them in all, including Kyle Shanahan, the offensive coordinator, is out in Washington. Mike Shanahan gone. And in this one, everyone saw this one coming a mile away. There was no situation where you could see the outcome being anything but Mike Shanahan being canned in Washington. Uh, this was a situation where it was quarterback versus head coach. You got a lot invested in that franchise QB. You spent a lot of picks to get him here into D.C. And... There's no way you could get rid of him and keep the head coach. It was a situation where Robert Griffin III didn't get along with the staff. They, they mismanaged a lot of these things, did the, the coaching staff. And Mike Shanahan is to blame for a lot that went on in Washington. A lot of the reports that surfaced and a lot of these different things that stirred up controversy in D.C. were the result of Mike Shanahan leaking stories to the press and it was just an immature situation in D.C. where a head coach that was supposed to be a two-time Super Bowl winning head coach that understood what it was supposed to take to rectify a situation in D.C. where the cap was bad, the, the roster was bad, and he was supposed to have enough people skills to make this relationship work with Robert Griffin III. They just didn't. They, they messed this thing up. They botched this whole situation, starting with the January playoff game against the Seahawks. From that point on, this relationship between quarterback and coach was damaged, and it was damaged beyond repair, and there was no trust there, and this whole thing went to hell in a handbasket. And Mike Shanahan, instead of him handling this like a two-time Super Bowl winning head coach, he handled this like a first-time head coach with an ego problem that needed to be the alpha male in the room, and he didn't go about it the right way. And this whole thing just got ugly. It got messy. And the only way that it could be fixed is if Mike Shanahan was out as head coach in Washington. And they made that official at 9.37 a.m. on Monday morning. So you move on to Tampa Bay, 11.42 a.m. This one was a bit of a surprise to me. And maybe not a surprise to you, but six weeks ago, seven weeks ago, this was supposed to happen. And I was leading the charge. I had a torch 
it was lit, and I had a pitchfork in the other hand, and I wanted the head of Greg Schiano on a platter. And then he turned things around. They beat the Dolphins. They played some competitive football down the stretch. They win four games after starting 0-8. And, and I thought he had done enough to salvage his job in Tampa Bay. GM Mark Dominic is also on the chopping block along with Greg Schiano. And this is how I feel this went down. Greg Schiano embarrassed the Glazers. Okay, this was an embarrassing season for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in more ways than one. Okay, you expect this team, you go out, look, the Glazers have been notoriously cheap over the years. Well, they opened up their wallets and their checkbooks, stroked a couple of checks, went out and got some guys, spent some money, and they felt like it was time for a return. They went out, they got Vincent Jackson, they spent money on Carl Nix, they went out and they got players, and some of them worked out. Like Vincent Jackson, some of them did not. And they felt like, okay, we, we've given you some options here to work with. Make it work. We went out and got Darrell Revis for you. We went out and did some things like Deshaun Golson. We went out, we spent money that has been perceived as money well spent. Time for some dividends to be yielded off of the money that we've spent on this football team. So, you look at the quarterbacking situation, and this is where it all really stems from. That whole situation with Josh Freeman, it got ugly, it got messy, it was embarrassing, you're losing football games. It appears that you're going to lose the locker room, but you don't. And they rally and they win games, they play competitive football, they hang in against San Francisco, they give them a run. They do some things down the stretch that look like there's a promising future in Tampa Bay if they can just right the ship but the damage was already done this was an embarrassing season and they were a laughing stock of the league for about a good four week stretch there where they had the saga with josh freeman going back and forth and ultimately letting him go and to start the season zero and eight and to have your season over essentially by the end of november pretty embarrassing pretty embarrassing the glazers didn't find that amusing at all and I think they had made their mind up as to what was going to happen with Greg Schiano by about week nine in this season. And at season's end, they didn't hesitate to get rid of him and Mark Dominic, the GM. And, and essentially what happens, it's a package deal. Like I explained with Cleveland and their situation, Mark Dominic handpicked Greg Schiano and it didn't work. And because it didn't work, Mark Dominic is to blame for Greg Schiano's failures. And so Mark Dominic also gets the ax in Tampa Bay. Now, I will say this. They've assembled a pretty good roster in Tampa Bay right now, especially on the defensive side of the football. I mean, you look at what they have defensively and what they're building offensively. I, I must say that Mark Dominic has done a pretty good job in, in terms of personnel. But in terms of picking a head coach to go out and get the most out of that personnel, he may have failed in that department. And I think ultimately that's what cost Mark Dominic his job is the fact that Greg Schiano may not have been the right man for the job in Tampa Bay. So there's a vacancy not only for head coach in Tampa Bay, but also as general manager. And if you have anything to learn from the Cleveland Browns, you go get the GM first and then the head coach thereafter you look at the last firing of black monday you find yourself at noon monday afternoon detroit lions part ways with head coach jim schwartz this to me was a long time coming this should have happened a while ago took long enough but it finally happened look again i'm not one to advocate coaches getting fired but this is a talented football team that should not be underachieving the way they do. And to me, this is an undisciplined football team. I've said this for two years strong. This is an undisciplined team. Marshall Falk has been probably the biggest advocate for Jim Schwartz being fired as he talked about how undisciplined this team is. Everybody can see this team is heavily penalized. This team is often outcoached. This team 
it, it, they do a lot of things fundamentally wrong and it starts at the top and anytime you have a team as talented as the Lions are year in and year out finishing third and last in their division and underachieving grossly and you got to start at the top and, and I think the pointing I think the blame needs to start with Jim Schwartz I think he's the common denominator here with all of the struggles in Detroit and I feel like the biggest issue with him is the lack of accountability. There's no accountability for his actions. He does a lot of things that I just don't agree with and I don't think are necessary. And you look at him and then you look at his team and you say, there's no accountability here. Guys act out, they pick up personal foul penalties, they do things on the field that lead to losses and there's no accountability. And the reason why there's no accountability is because you can't even hold the head coach to a certain standard because he himself is a hothead. He himself is undisciplined. So how are you going to hold the players to a higher standard? Now, I could be wrong. And in all of these different situations, and I'll go back and I'll break down all the, the player uh, reactions to all these situations here in a second. But the players, they seem to have liked Jim Schwartz, but you can like a head coach all you want. The Tampa Bay Buccaneer players loved Raheem Morris in Tampa Bay, but they quit on him. And they were just, he was too nice. And in the case of Jim Schwartz, he was undisciplined and so was his team, and it was time for a change. And I'll leave it at that. They needed to make a change. This change should have been made two years ago, frankly. But he continued to get opportunities and Finally, it ran out. And, and the reason he didn't get fired two years ago, they made the postseason. He bought himself more time with that postseason run they made uh, two years ago. He was going to get fired after that season. They made it to the postseason. He kept his job. The next year, they go back to being the Detroit Lions of old. They win four games. They're the worst team in their division. So, uh, look, it is what it is. But... This was a long time coming and finally happened. Jim Schwartz out as head coach in Detroit. And that happened at noon on Black Monday. So now let's go back down these teams and let's talk about player reaction and then we'll talk about potential replacements and get out of here. So you go back to the Texans and their situation. I think the players aren't going to miss Gary Kubiak in Houston. I feel like his time ran out and the way he was doing things I just think that he kind of outgrew this, this roster outgrew him. And it, it was time for a change in Houston. And right now, potential candidates, they said that they want a coach with head coaching experience. And I guess that seems to be the hot thing. Everybody wants a head coach with experience, but everybody's not going to get a head coach with head coaching experience in the NFL. I tell you what, this is my theory, and you can debunk it if you like, but I'm sticking to this one. This is the way I feel. The Texans said that they wanted to have their head coach by Tuesday. I think their rationale and their thinking was, we'll get Ken Wisenhunt. He's the offensive coordinator of the San Diego Chargers. Chargers aren't making the playoffs. The Dolphins are going to beat the Jets. The Ravens are going to find a way in. Somebody will stop the Chargers from getting into the postseason, and we'll be able to interview Ken Wisenhunt on Monday and then we'll like what we hear from him and we'll hire him Tuesday. That's the rationale that I thought was going to happen and I think they thought was going to happen. Chargers make the postseason. They don't have access to Ken Wisenhunt. They're ready to speed up this process. So they've eliminated him from their coaching search. So now it comes back around to ex-Patriots offensive coordinator and current Penn State head coach Bill O'Brien and to me he doesn't have head coaching experience in the NFL that's number one but he seems to have garnered and seems to have warranted a lot of respect in league circles and seems to be a hot name out there in the coaching search and so he seems to be the first guy that comes to mind in Houston as the front runner to get that job in Houston. Don't count out Lovey Smith. 
and, and a couple of other coaches. But to me, I think Bill O'Brien is going to end up as the next head coach of the Houston Texans. He's an offensive-minded guy, and the next head coach that they need to come in there needs to be offensive-minded to help shore up what used to be an explosive offense in Houston. I think that's the direction they're going to go in with the Texans. They don't need a guy like Lovey Smith who is defensive-minded when you already got Wade Phillips on the staff. If Wade Phillips is coming back as your defensive coordinator, you just need an offensive mind as a head coach. I think that's the direction that they'll go in in Houston. You look at the Cleveland Browns. I talked about Michael Lombardi, and, and he's a guy that's a Belichick disciple coming from that tree. It wouldn't surprise me if they wanted to bark up that tree and, and try to get a Belichick disciple. Uh, Bill O'Brien would fit that mold. So would uh, Josh McDaniels. I'm hearing his name in the Cleveland search. I don't know if the Browns want to go that route again. They went that route with Eric Mangini. That didn't really work out in Cleveland. Don't know if they want to go to a retread. They went the retread route. They went the Belichick tree route with Mangini. It didn't work. And they would be doing the exact same thing. Retread in Josh McDaniels, Belichick tree. It just sounds wrong right now for where the Browns are. But who's to say if that's the direction they want to go in or not? I think they want to go offensive-minded, but it wouldn't surprise me if they went defensive-minded head coach. But to me, you got Ray Horton running this defense. They were a top-10 defense. I don't see why you need to make a change there unless you're elevating Ray Horton to head coach. And I don't even think they're going to do that or not. I'm not sure how they feel about Ray Horton as a head coaching candidate. But, I mean, that's somebody to consider for that job as well. But if he's still there as your D coordinator, you got to go offensive minded, I think, because he's got the defense on lock. He's got them playing good football. You need a guy that's going to jumpstart the offense and you need a coach that's going to work closely with that quarterback. I think the Browns are going to go offensive minded and Ken Wisenhunt comes to mind. I think he's a guy that is going to be a hot commodity out there. Jay Gruden, offensive coordinator in Cincinnati, could be a name that's tossed around. There are several names. I already talked about Josh McDaniels. He's supposed to be an offensive mind. So there's several names out there that come to mind. Talked about Bill O'Brien. So Browns have several options. We'll see what direction they decide to go in. Vikings are next up. And I think I failed to talk about the Browns and the players. I think they were all surprised. Joe Thomas spoke out, was very candid in saying that, hey, look, good franchises don't fire their head coach after one season. I agree with them. I think that statement sums it up that you can't do that. You can't fire Chazinski because you made a mistake in hiring him first before the GM. Um, I, I just felt like he should have been given more time to turn this thing around in Cleveland. One year isn't enough time to do anything, especially when you're taking over a bad football team. It's one thing if you come into a situation, good football team, that – you know, won 10 games the year before and their head coach decides to retire, you step in and the team goes from a 10-win team and a playoff team to a two-win team and it's a mutiny in the locker room. Yeah, get rid of the coach. But that, that wasn't what the Browns' situation was. He stepped into a bad situation. It didn't get much better, but he didn't have time to help it get better yet. And so I, I don't agree with that. And the players didn't agree with that in the locker room in Cleveland. And they didn't agree with the firing in Minnesota of Leslie Frazier either uh, players spoke out about how he changed them as players as a man and he was a great coach and they just felt like they should have done more to save his job and Christian Ponda spoke about how he gave him an opportunity and how he'll be forever indebted to him and I look at Christian Ponda and I'm like you dude you were the one that helped him get fired and, and Christian basically said as much we should have played better and he, when he said we, he was probably saying more like me. I should have played better. And, yeah, you're right. You should have played better. If you do play better, he's still the head coach in Minnesota. I actually thought that after the start they had to the season for them to finish up the way they did, I thought it was good enough for him to keep his job. But Rick Spielman and the brass in the Vikings front office just felt like it was time to go in a different direction. I always felt like Leslie Frazier was going to get a raw deal. He was set up for failure in Minnesota. I never thought that it was going to end well for him there because he didn't have a quarterback. But again, I always revert back to he had a say in that quarterback search. 
he was in the draft room, in the war room, when they made Christian Ponder that early first round draft pick. And so you live with that pick, you die with that pick, and, and he went down on that sinking ship. You look at the Washington Redskins, and oh, let me just talk about Minnesota briefly and move on. They want a head coach, and they've already expressed this with head coaching pedigree that's already been a coach in this league. So they're looking for a retread. And to me, Lovey Smith comes to mind in Minnesota. This is a really good defensive football team with a lot of pieces in place to be a great defense. If they get the right head coach in there that can push this defense and get the most out of them. I think Leslie Frazier was a defensive-minded coach that got this defense to play some good football. They might be looking for an offensive-minded head coach because the offense was so porous, because they don't have a quarterback right now that you can look at as the future franchise QB. Maybe they want the head coach and the quarterback to come in and work with each other. Maybe they want the defense to continue on the path that they're on, and if they want to do that, a guy like Lovey Smith makes the most sense. We'll see what they decide to do if they want to go offensive or defensive-minded. I think Lovey Smith would be an excellent fit here, but I think there are two more places that Lovey Smith would be even better for, and I'll talk about them later. If I had to guess, I, I would say that the Vikings get someone that we're not really thinking about right now, a guy that might be like a Ken Wizen Hunt that's on someone's staff that is in the postseason that you can't have access to right now. Wouldn't surprise me if that's the case in Minnesota. You look at the Redskins, it's a it's anybody's guess. Look, 99% of the locker room wanted him back as head coach. But the one percent that didn't, that being Robert Griffin the third, and guys like Joshua Morgan, who probably won't be on this roster anyhow, they didn't want him back. And I think Robert Griffin III not wanting him back was enough to not have him back. It was essentially him against the rest of the locker room, and he went out. And in terms of a head coaching replacement, it's hard to say. It really is because Bruce Allen has stepped up. He said, okay, I'm in charge now. I'm in charge of personnel. I'm going to run the show. I'm going to find the next head coach. He basically stepped up to the podium and said, it's on me now, and I'm taking over. And I, I don't know who wants, A, I don't know who wants this job. B, I don't know what their rationale and their thinking is right now as to what they're looking for in the next head coach. I just hope they don't go the college route because I don't think that's the answer. I don't think Art Bryles is the answer. I'm hearing his name being tossed out there. And, and honestly, I don't think Art Bryles thinks he's the answer either. Money talks, though, and, you know, guys can say, hey, I'm comfortable where I am. You throw money at them, and it's a lot. It can change their mind very quickly, but I'm hoping the Redskins get their hands on a guy like Ken Winston Hunt, someone of that nature, someone offensive-minded, because I feel like if they retain Hazlitt, which he's still on the staff as of today, if they retain Raheem Morris, I think there's enough there to uh, – to keep the defense, or at least get them better, because the defense was atrocious a year ago, but there's some deficiencies there. You go out, you spend some money in the offseason to make the defense better, I think. With those guys in place, this defense can become better. I'm actually a huge fan of Jim Hazlitt, and I think he didn't do that bad of a job. I just think the personnel wasn't good enough. So we'll see how that all works itself out. But I think the Redskins need an offensive-minded head coach that can work closely with Robert Griffin III and maximize his potential in this league. I'd love to see Ken Wisenhunt get that job. I think he would be the right man for that job. But again, you, you can never tell what's going to happen in the nation's capital. You look at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and Greg Schiano, and mixed reviews in that locker room. Some guys loved him. Some guys uh, couldn't see him leave fast enough. At the end of the day, I think that in Tampa Bay, Lovey Smith makes the most sense there. You know, they're in Detroit. And you can go ahead and lump these two in together because Detroit, uh, the players, they'll all say that, you know, they're going to miss Jim Schwartz and that they felt like he was the right guy for the job, yada, yada, yada. But at the end of the day, it's obvious he's not the right man for the job. They need more discipline there. They need more structure in Detroit. 
in Tampa Bay, they had a lot of structure, but then they didn't. It was supposed to be an organized um, setup, and Greg Schiano was supposed to have things organized and disciplined in that locker room, and it seemed unorganized and scattered when that whole Josh Freeman situation unfolded and unraveled. So from that standpoint, I think the Buccaneers would be honored to have Lovey Smith. I think the Detroit Lions would be in great shape to get Lovey Smith. Either one of those destinations, I feel like Lovey Smith would be a great fit in Tampa Bay because this defense is young, they're hungry, they're ferocious, they can work. And with Lovey Smith putting his Midas touch on that defense, they could be the number one defense in the league easily. But at the same time, I think you also have to look at this offense and you feel like, and he said this, and this is why I think he can work in Tampa Bay. He said, if you get me, Jeff Tedford is a package deal with me. I'm bringing him on as my offensive coordinator. And we know what he's done with quarterbacks. He's got the Midas touch when it comes to quarterbacks, including Aaron Rodgers, out of Cal. And so what he could do with Mike Glennon in Tampa Bay in that offense could be scary. You, you get Lovey Smith and what he'll do with that defense. I'll tell you what, that would be a match made in heaven for Tampa Bay. You look at Detroit, and I feel the same way about Lovey Smith there as well. You look at what Lovey Smith could do with that defense with Indama Kansu and Nick Fairley and Ziggy Ansah and DeAndre Levy at linebacker and what they have in the secondary with Delmas and Quinn and some of the pieces that they're putting together on that defensive side of the football. He could do some things with that defense in Detroit. And we know what this offense is. If Tedford could get his hands on Stafford and with heavens to Megatron and Reginald Bush, look, the Lions are ready to go. You get the right coach in there with the right philosophy and the right frame of mind. You get some structure and some organization and some discipline. The Lions could be an 11-win team next year and win the NFC North. I mean, that's how talented that football team is. So I think Lovey Smith would be a great fit in either Tampa or Detroit. But if you don't get your hands on one of them, if you're Tampa Bay, I think you need a defensive mind and head coach because I think the defense is going to be the key to that football team. If you can stop teams from scoring points and you get the right offensive coordinator, you can always find an offensive coordinator that can run your, your team. You need a head coach that's going to come in there and be defensive minded if you're Tampa Bay. I think Lovey Smith is that guy. If not Lovey Smith, don't be afraid to go looking around the league. There are some really good defensive coordinators that I think could come in and do a great job in Tampa Bay and really help turn this thing around. If you're the Detroit Lions, you need a proven coach with a track record. You don't need some hot assistant. You don't need some guy that doesn't have the respect of this locker room the minute he steps in there. You need a head coach that has proven himself in this league. You need Lovey Smith. If you're the Lions, you go out and you make the push to get Lovey Smith in there. You do whatever it takes. You throw money at him. You give him all the stuff that he needs to hear to make him the guy in Detroit. And you make it happen because you you have a locker room full of veterans, full of guys that are ready to win now. And if you stick the right head coach like a Lovey Smith in there, I think they could take off. Sky's the limit. And I feel like if you don't get Lovey Smith, you need to go get Ken Wisenhunt. He's a guy that's been to the Super Bowl. He commands respect around this league. He can take this offense to new heights. You find a defensive coordinator that can come in and, and get that defense playing well. Uh, and Ken Wisenhunt, he knows guys around the league. He's got guys that he can bring in with him. You need to either get Wisenhunt or you got to get Lovey Smith if you're in Detroit. That's the way I feel. A proven coach with a track record that's been to the Super Bowl that will command the respect of that locker room the minute he steps in it. If you're the Detroit Lions, that's the route you need to take. And so... That's essentially Black Monday in a nutshell. And look, I'll give you some situations to keep your eye on as well. Even though Black Monday is over, don't take your eyes off of these situations. The Oakland Raiders and Dennis Allen. Reggie McKenzie has already got the vote of confidence. He'll be back. He'll be the GM. He'll get a chance to right the ship in Oakland. 
Not the same can be said for Dennis Allen quite yet. Dennis Allen feels confident that he'll be back. He already issued a statement saying, hey, I feel confident I'll be back. But what head coach doesn't feel like he'll be back? You ask Greg Schiano what he thought waking up on Monday morning. He said, I thought I was going to be the head coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So every head coach thinks they're going to be back. I'm not so sure about Dennis Allen in Oakland. Keep your eye on that situation. In Tennessee, Mike Munchak, they're really mulling over that decision. He's been with that organization over three decades. So keep your eye on Mike Munchak. They had a very, very disappointing season after starting 3-1. and one. He barely escaped with his job last year, and he didn't do much better this season. Be hard-pressed to see him keeping his job in Tennessee. But again, there's a lot of loyalty involved in that situation, and they feel like Jake Locker getting injured had an impact on the season. There's a lot of moving parts there. Keep your eye on Mike Munchak in Tennessee as well. In New York with the Jets, Rex Ryan has been given a new lease on life. They finished up the season strong. And again, this is my stance on Rex Ryan. This was a four-win team. The talent that was given to him in this season, the mess that Mike Tannenbaum left him with, this was a four-win roster. Right here. I mean, to win eight games, he should be up for coach of the year. No doubt. I mean, that was a ragtag bunch on offense. Defensively, he had those guys playing out of their gourd. He got a one-year extension. He couldn't go into this year as a lame duck coach. I think that's the right thing to do. Give him another year to prove himself. See what happens. They got to clean up the books in New York. They got to get some of those contracts restructured and they got to get more talent in there on the offensive side of the football but he did a lot with a little and so he's been retained in New York but only for an extra year if they flame out in 2014 he'll be fired so that's something to keep an eye on as well but he's going to be back in New York but keep your eye on Oakland keep your eye on Tennessee those head coaches aren't out of the woods quite yet and in a nutshell that's Black Monday in the National Football League. Like the content? Want more? Sub up. In the lab room.